I'd like to welcome you to the third session of Groundwater U, which is sponsored by the U.S. Department of Energy, NASA, the Boeing Company, and the California Department of Toxic Substances Control. Um, just going to do a quick overview of the things that I've been saying at the beginning of each session, because we do have some folks that haven't been to the previous two sessions. So um, a review of why we're doing this. Um, Boeing, DOE, and NASA submitted to the talk, uh, Department of Toxic Substances Control, Substances Control, a very complex, multi-volume technical document that we're calling the Groundwater Investigation Report. And DTSC will be sponsoring an opportunity for the public to provide comments on that document um, starting in about June timeframe. Um, I know, I'm, <laughs> I realized I was looking the wrong way. Is it still June? that we're planning on the public comment period? Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, just uh, everybody sat down and looked at the document and thought this is going to be really hard for the public to comment on because it's such a big technical document. So they decided to put together this series of um, education seminars um, so that to provide an opportunity for you to learn more about groundwater so that you would, can be prepared if you would like to review that document. Um, what is? Next slide, Tom. <laughs> um, what is Groundwater U? It's a series of six sessions, informational presentations. Um, it's a lot like a university class. In other words, we're not repeating information from one session to the next. So um, we're building on the information that's already been presented. All of the presentations are, um, will begin at 6.30 p.m. Um, and then there will be a geology field trip on April 30th. Um, it's not too late to register to be here, and let me tell you, one of the benefits of registering is that means that you're on the Eventbrite website, and when we want to get information out to you, it's really easy, because all of the, ad the email addresses for people that are registered are there together. So I um, encourage you, if you haven't yet registered and you intend to come to future sessions, to please go ahead and register. Um, the GL oh. Yeah, okay, I'll come back to that. Go ahead. Um, there's actually two separate ses sections. How do I say this? Two separate sets of sessions. The first set is introductory sessions. Um, we've already had geology and hydrogeology and contaminant um, fate and transport. Um, tonight's session is on groundwater remedial alternatives. The second set of sessions is site specific, so the information that is presented will be specifically about Santa Susana Field Laboratory. Um, the fourth session will be groundwater flow at Santa Susana Field Lab, the fifth groundwater source, I mean contaminant sources at Santa Susana, and then the sixth one, contaminant fate and transport, what's known about where the contaminants have gone. So that's the second set. This is the last of the first, the introductory sessions. Okay, these are all here, but you're not coming back here again. Um, the next three will be at the Corporate Point West Hills Auditorium. Um, if you have a notebook, in the front cover is a map of where that is located. If you don't have one, stop at the registration table, and I'm sure they can give you one. Um, so from here on out, the, the rest of the sessions will be there. We were trying to split the difference so people aren't driving so far. Um, Let's see. So again, this is the third in the first set. Um, Dr. Matt Becker is back. He did our, our last presentation. And um, yeah, we're glad he's back. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Woo <-hoo! laughs> um, So let's go on. Um, and the second um, set of sessions is going to be handled a little bit differently. We're not going to have one presenter for each session. We're going to have a series of uh, three people present. Yes, Chris? Okay, we can do that. Again, register on Eventbrite so we have a way of notifying you, okay? Because we can send anything we want to the folks that are registered. Um, at any rate, the second set of sessions will be um, co-presented by three people that um, comprise 
an advisory panel that's been working at Santa Susana Field Laboratory for about 12 years. Dr. John Cherry, Dr. David McWhorter, and Dr. Beth Parker. And so they will be co-presenting all three of those sessions. Next slide. I want to tell you a little bit more about the field trip. We told you last time that we had too many people for one. And so what we've done is we're going to run two field trips on the 30th. One will be from 8.30 in the morning till um, slightly after noon, and the second one will be from 1.30 to 5.30 in the afternoon. Um, we can only accommodate 120 people. That's it. We're getting close. If you haven't registered on Eventbrite, you need to do that, because that's only people that have registered are going to be able to go on the field trip. Um, yes? There is a piece of paper in the middle of every table, and we'd like for you to indicate your preference as to whether you would prefer to be in the morning or the afternoon. And we will be um, figuring out which one people are assigned to on a first come, first served basis based on your registration on Eventbrite. Yes, sir? Saturday, April 30th. Yes. Um, if you contact us ahead of time, we'll make every effort that we can. There will be places on the tour where you get off the bus and you walk away from the bus on a not particularly good walking path. So we will make every effort that we can to accommodate people, but it won't be, um, you may not get to go everywhere. Okay. Um, we have to have an email address or a phone number to be able to let you know which tour we're putting you into. So please, when you sign up on the piece of paper, let us know how we can get in touch with you, because otherwise we won't have the ability to do that. Um, I checked this afternoon, and there's about 30 slots left. There are some of the people in the room right now that haven't registered yet. So if you want to go, please register so that we know you're coming. Um, next slide. A little bit about the information materials. If you've been here before, uh, if you registered and you've been here before, you should have a notebook. If you haven't registered, we're just giving you copies of the um, presentation slides from tonight. Um, let's see. The other thing I wanted to tell you about that, we're, uh, the presenters are letting us know information materials that they think you might benefit from. And so one of the reasons we want you to register is to be able to let you know when those things become available. I've got two that we've got pending requests, you know, all that, those rules about copyright. I'm all caught up in those rules right now, trying to get permissions for us to provide some of these materials to you. So if we have, if you're registered on Eventbrite, as soon as those materials are released for us to share with you, we will be sending them. So that's another reason to please get registered. Uh, so. I think that's all I need to say about that one. Tonight, we're going to, as soon as we finish, then Dr. Becker will do his presentation, and then we'll take questions and answers at the end. I want to go over really quick the ground rules that we're using for these sessions one more time. Please limit the distractions to the extent possible. So put your cell phone on vibrate or silent mode. Um, if you need to talk to somebody, please go out of the room to do that so that other people can still hear what's going on. Um, we are asking that you hold your questions till the very end of the presentation. Matt has a lot of information he wants to share with you tonight. And so to help him be able to do that, we'd like you to hold your questions to the extent possible till the very end. Um, try to remember what the subject matter is tonight. Tonight is groundwater remediation approaches. So ask questions that are about the subject matter that we're covering tonight, if you can. Um, when we, you have a question that you'd like to ask. It's a bigger room tonight. We're really going to need you to comply with this. Raise your hand. Steffi missed Jazzercise this afternoon. She's ready to run around the room and bring the microphone to you. So let us know and we'll bring the microphone to you so we can hear you when you ask a question. Um, and just a reminder that this is not a comment meeting. DTSC is going to be hosting comment meetings starting in June about the document. The purpose tonight is to ask uh, questions if you, if you have those questions to ask. Um, save your comments for when they'll have somebody there to record those comments for you. When we 
finish the presentation, I'll go back to the questions that we have recorded on the flip charts and let you know where we are in answering those questions. This is where we're putting questions that didn't belong in the session that they were asked. So we'll get back to those. I'm sorry I'm making that noise, aren't I? Um, so we'll go, we'll go over those questions before, before we get started on the questions tonight. Okay? Tom. Yeah, I keep forgetting where you are. <laughs> Hi. Oh, okay, so um, good evening. Um, for those of you who've been here for the last two meetings, um, I, I've done a little quick introduction, but tonight, I just want to talk about tonight's presentation. If, um, you, if you look ahead at the schedule and you've read the RI report, um, you will have noticed that we really, there's no real discussion about remedial approaches for the site specifically. So tonight's a general discussion about the remediation. And the reason that we're, the reason that we're not going down that road for the site, or why we're not talking about that, is we're in the middle of characterization on the site. The RI report deals with characterization. And only when we're done with the characterization, we understand the extent of all the contaminants and how they're behaving, will we really start to make decisions about the remedial um, alternatives for the site. So I'll put that in perspective. So if it's this far off, the question is, of course, why are we talking about it tonight? And there's really three main reasons. Uh, first of all, we have this opportunity here for the groundwater university, this, this groundwater U, to, to, to talk to you about, about remediation alternatives. And when we do characterization and we approach a site, it's not in the vacuum. We, we're always thinking about what the final remedy will be of the site. Um, of course, that evolves as the characterization moves forward, but we've got to always keep that in the back of our minds to make sure that we're collecting the right data as we move through the process. So that's one good reason to talk about that today. Another reason is the 2007 consent order uh, put something in motion, and there's two documents that have been submitted to the department that are under review right now. That's the treatability studies work plan and the feasibility studies work plan. And both of these deal with looking initially at the remediation approaches that could be used that have potential at the site. So um, if you're wanting to read those, those are on, the, on, our, on our website. Um, and this will help you give you a basis when you read those, those reports, if you're, if you're interested in them, of what's being presented in those particular reports. And the third reason we're talking about remediation tonight or this soon is because from a groundwater standpoint, I think this is probably going to be the most important discussion we're going to have with you as the community and the one that we're going to need the most input because at the end of the day, when we're done with the characterization, it's what are we going to do with the problem that's there? And we want to make sure that everyone's included in that process and that thought because there's going to be a lot of things to consider, um, as Dr. Becker will go over, when we start looking at different remedial approaches for the site. So in that regard, I don't think it's ever too early to start this kind of dialogue with everyone. So um, with that in mind, I just want to kind of remind everyone, again, Wendy's brought it up, that we're going to have an opportunity. We'll be opening up public comment on the RI report. We'll be having meetings in June. That's a good time to start talking about the characterization and also talk. We can talk a little bit about remediation, although it's not the subject of that particular report. But that's a good time. And also, you got my phone number, my email. You can always drop me a line. So that's kind of all I wanted to say, at least to kind of frame tonight's talk. And um, I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Becker right now. And I'm going to read this so I don't get this wrong, OK? <laughs> Dr. Becker is a, is a Conray Chair of Hydrogeology and a professor at Cal State University Long Beach. He has 20 years experience in hydrology and has held several research positions in both the public and the private sector. He was a Fulbright Scholar at the University of uh, Trento, Italy. Prior to arriving at Long Beach State, he was an Associate Professor of Geology for 10 years at State University of New York in Buffalo. He has worked in diverse areas, including hydrology, uh, related to hydrology, including fractured rock hydrology, tracer and hydraulic characterization, remote sensing, uh, hydrogeophysics, and numerical model modeling. <clears throat> and with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Becker.
Thank you. So you're back for more. Thank you. Uh, before I go on, I really want to thank you for last time, for those of you that were here. I mean, uh, you, were, you were fabulous. You were so patient. And uh, you asked great questions, thoughtful questions. And uh, it, was, it was a pleasure last time. And, and this time should actually be easier, because the, uh, the subject matter is a little more uh, straightforward, I think. And it's remediation. So um, it's, a, it's a short outline because it's a, a little bit uh, a simpler topic this time. It's, uh, we've got some contaminated bedrock. We need to clean it up. So it's not quite as simple as this. Uh, this is a, me vacuuming a rock at our field site in, uh, in New York. Um, my students took this picture because they wanted to have evidence that I was a, a closet engineer. <laughs> and so I got the, I got, you know, see, I, I got the field boots on, but the, the vacuum kind of gives me away. So we're going to cover, uh, first of all, you know, what, what are we talking about with remediation? And then uh, uh, what are the goals of remediation? And uh, of course, we'll go through some methods to give you an idea of what's, what's available, what's out there. Oh, I forgot I have a button here. Let's try that. Okay. <clears throat> so um, we're going to talk about the, the, the technologies that are out there. In, in reference to uh, bedrock systems, okay? So uh, one of the first things I want to point out is, is you'll see a lot of remediation methods that uh, uh, are talked about in general. They're not all applicable to, to bedrock because bedrock, as we discussed last time, is a little bit more challenging. So first of all, what do we mean by remediation? Uh, we're, we're trying to remedy a problem, obviously, so we want to get the, uh, uh, the system back to as close as to the, how it was before it became uh, contaminated. So uh, the first question you ask is, you know, how clean do we want this to be? How clean, if we want it this clean, are we technically able to get it this clean? Now this is a, a picture that I took in, uh, uh, this is a drainage from a glacier in uh, uh, an alpine glacier in the, the Alps of Italy. Um, my, my life is not always so exciting, but every once in a while I get to do things like this. And they flew us out there in a helicopter, and so nobody's around. There's no contamination uh, around. And this is, this is background, right? This is the ultimate background. There's no uh, influence of humans uh, up here. And even in this place, you're going to find some atmospheric deposition that, that is going to, you'll get very low concentrations of, of some compounds. But you know, this, is, this is obviously not the background that we want to get to, because as we talked about last time, there's always going to be other contaminants in the, in the groundwater from other sources, right? And so uh, you know, we have to find a, a reasonable goal to work toward. So this is taken from a uh, National Research Council document. It's pretty old now, 1994, but things haven't changed a whole lot. These are, uh, are terms for alternative goals that they laid out. And so starting from the, uh, the most ambitious, we could go for complete restoration, right? Return it to exactly the way it was before it became contaminated, which is what we'd all like to see. Um, if you can't do that, maybe we can, we can get it back to at least uh, detectable in it. So in, in this first one, this complete restoration, you have to assume that you can actually measure everything to concentrations that, uh, that, that were what they were before uh, there was any contamination. And we can't always do that. Um, we might clean it to health-based standards, okay? Maximum contaminant limits or, or drinking water limits, all right? That would, be, that would be good, right? If we could get it back to uh, drinking water standards. Um, we can't do that. Perhaps we could set up sort of a risk-based standard. So let's not maybe get it to do drinking water everywhere, let's, let's consider who's going to be drinking the water and what are the, what are the risks involved in leaving it maybe not entirely clean. Okay, and then there's technological limits. Maybe even if we have these lofty goals, we may not have the technology to get the, the water back to the way it was. Um, another way you can, you can uh, um, remediate but not, not entirely the background is to, to limit the access, right? So we're, we're trying to clean it to the point where, you know, any access, uh, anybody who accesses the site will be safe and we limit who can access the, say, the site so we make sure that uh, everybody's safe. And then um, if all else fails, maybe we can just contain it, 
all right? We'll keep everybody off the site, limit access, contain it, make sure nothing goes off the site, and we just give up remediating it. That's, that's the, the worst case scenario, is we just basically in, entomb the stuff there, all right? So this is the range of remediation goals. And um, I wanna say a bit more about risk-based limits because um, this is uh, quite a process actually, trying to determine who's at risk. So you have basically a source and you've got a receptor, what we say is a receptor, somebody who is uh, uh, at risk from this contamination. So when I did my master's at, at Texas, I, um, I worked in a, uh, uh, my, my thesis is about a low level radioactive waste facility that was going to be, they were trying to license. Okay, it hadn't been built yet. These were risk assessments. And so uh, it was in the Hueco uh, Balsan where the groundwater table is 400 feet deep and it's dry. They get less than 11 inches of rain uh, a year. And in fact, it's so dry, you don't have rainwater percolating down. You had water actually evaporating from groundwater moving upward. So we measured the, the hydraulics and, and water was moving upward. So what would happen if there is a, a, a breach in the landfill? And so we had a, a risk assessment scenario in which this is the, the, the scenario that we thought was, was uh, most at risk. And, and what would happen is you get a breach from the landfill, you get percolation downward, but then, then that, that contamination, which is radionuclides is what we're assuming, would actually come back up to the surface. And then what would happen? Well, then that would dry up and it would accumulate at the surface. And then what could happen? Well, somebody could plant crops on that soil and then they raise cows, and the cows are gonna eat that grass, and then they feed that milk to their baby, okay? And this was actually the risk, one of the, one of the risk assessment scenarios that we looked at. So the, the, the receptor eventually was this baby of the farmer, and, and we had to do this over 10,000 years, mind you. Sometime in the future, this baby is going to uh, drink this milk that came from the cow, that came from the grass, that came from the soil, that came from the contamination, that came from the landfill. It's like the, the what's that song with the fly? <laughs> right. So this is a rather complicated example, and, and, and perhaps, a, it's a real one, but it was perhaps a bit, a bit extreme. But the idea is that you've got contamination, you've got a pathway, and then you've got a receptor. All right, so all those things have to be identified. And, and once you get beyond that, then you're, you're dealing with, uh, with, with risk that's uh, not unlike uh, what a, uh, uh, an actuary does for insurance. So you could have multiple uh, pathways. So you have a risk not only, say, from groundwater, but you might have uh, you know, dust blowing off the site or surface water. And so there are multiple pathways, multiple receptors, and multiple sources. So just to give you an idea of what's involved in that. So um, given a contaminated site, usually the first thing that uh, uh, you're going to want to look at um, uh, once you've, you've taken care of the immediate dangers is reducing the source. And uh, this is sort of the, the initial reaction to anything. We want to find out whatever the, whatever the source is, we want to contain that, remove it, destroy it. So you know, if it's, a, uh, if it's a surface source, we want to dig it up and take it to a hazardous waste landfill. If it's a plume that's already in the groundwater, we want to see if we can treat that before it, it moves off downstream. And, um, and so, you know, here's a, here's a, this is, I think, from the document that they, do they have this in their packet, Wendy? Yeah, this, this fact one. Okay, okay so yes. you, I think you have this, uh, this. And so the idea is that if you can get rid of this, then you're just, you're cutting off the source to the, to the plume, and eventually this is uh, either going to dissipate or, or degrade or, take care of itself. So if you can find this and remove it, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's the first step that, that we would want to take. Um, this is from a, uh, a 2005, again, the National Research Council. They have a series of, of documents that uh, you can mine for this kind of information. Um, and what they're trying to show here is on this, uh, on this axis, if you will, the cube, we have um, uh, technologies for cleaning up these, these source contaminations. And uh, on this axis, we have basically our remediation goals. So this might be, um, what is this? This, this might be to risk-based limits, and this is, uh, um, I'm to make sure I'm going in the right direction here. Yeah, so 
Um, so this, this is basically uh, easy and this is harder. <laughs> so these are, you know, to background levels and this might be to, uh, uh, to just risk-based limits, okay. And then on this axis, they have hydrogeologic settings. So these are perhaps alluvium that, that are really easy to clean up. And then down here, we have bedrock. So these get harder. And what they're showing here is this cube is actually filled out in, this, uh, in the appendix to this thing. And they've got the uh, potential for these, these uh, technologies for cleaning up uh, to this limit in this kind of site using this kind of technology. So obviously, I don't want to, you know, to go through particular examples of this, but the point I'm making here is that there is no one remediation goal that works for every site, for every cleanup objective. For every cleanup objective and every site, there is a remediation technique that's going to work best. So what we're talking about, uh, what we talked about last time was, was um, uh, contaminant transport, which factors into this, this uh, remedial investigation. So the first thing you want to know is, is we, need, we need to be able to characterize the site so we can start making uh, some decisions about what remediation technologies we might want to use and, and what sort of goals we want to set. So um, I, um, uh, there, there's a database that the EPA maintains called cluin.org, and they actually have a subset of that database for fractured bedrock. And so what I did is I went through and I, I uh, took out all the sites that were uh, contamination of TCE and bedrock, which is obviously of, of concern uh, in this room. And so you can see that, first of all, that you're, you're not alone. There's only, I think there's about 80 sites that are in this database, and, and Santa Susana is not one of them, right? So we know we're missing some sites. There's many, many sites. There, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of sites that are TCE contamination, and within that, there's this, the subtopic of those that are in bedrock, which are the hardest to clean up. So you can see that, that uh, this, is, this is a national problem. So these, these decisions are being made at many different sites, and there's a lot of experience being generated about what works and what doesn't work, all right? So, you know, you're not alone or we're not alone trying to decide uh, what's gonna be done. I wanna focus on TC, uh, TCE and bedrock because it's, it's clearly the, uh, uh, the most difficult remediation problem that, uh, that we're looking at in this particular case. I'll, uh, I'll make some mention of other contaminants, but, but since this is the, uh, the, the most difficult one, I wanted to spend most of the time on that. So um, this is also from this document, and um, I thought this was kind of interesting. And, and one of the things that um, you should probably know is that uh, we're learning from all these sites every day. And uh, you know, our, 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 we're getting, we hope we're getting better and better at understanding uh, contamination, TCE, or, or solvent contamination in bedrock. And we've come a long way. Certainly, we haven't solved uh, all the problems. We're pretty far from that. But, if you look back in the, uh, so what's this showing a sort of old school paradigm and then the new, new school, sort of what's the more currently uh, accepted idea and when, when we sort of came to realize that. So back in the 40s and 70s, we thought it was a pretty good idea if we have a bunch of solvents to get rid of it, let's just go dump it in a pit. And uh, in, in, uh, I showed you a bunch of, uh, of uh, sites, and I'll show you again today, some sites near uh, Buffalo and Niagara Falls because I'm familiar with them. And uh, you know what they do a lot of in these limestones is they, they dig out gravel pits. Wow, a gravel pit, what a great hole. Let's throw some garbage in it. Let's throw solvents in it. Let's throw PCBs and hazardous weights in it because, because it's just this big hole in the ground, right? That's what Love Canal was. It was they dug the canal. They were going to try and, and make a, a, a power plant at the end of that canal. They ran out of money, and they left this big hole in the ground. So, hey, let's fill it up with, with contaminants. So uh, this is the idea for a long time, and it was in the, in the 70s when you started realizing that was maybe not so good. Um, and then once we figured out that, uh, that you can contaminate groundwaters this way, we thought, well, we'll just pump the, pump the water out, and uh, we'll be good. And uh, in, in the, earlier than probably the 90s, we started to realize it wasn't working very well. And I'll, I'll talk about pump and treat uh, a little bit later. And then uh, during this time, it was, uh, it was thought that chlorinated solvents uh, couldn't degrade on their own biologically. 
I know when I was uh, in, in the 90s, when I went to uh, school in environmental engineering, they were just figuring out that, that things can degrade quite well. Many compounds can degrade quite well under anaerobic conditions without the presence of oxygen. Before that, we always thought it took oxygen to, to degrade things at any, any reasonable rate. Uh, and then in the 90s, it was discovered that chlorinated solvents could actually biodegrade uh, in the absence of oxygen. In fact, they de degraded better in the, uh, the uh, absence of oxygen. In the 90s, we, I don't know if I like this one, but uh, um, this is sort of uh, our, our uh, period of, uh, of hopefulness that uh, all these emerging technologies are going to come along and we're going to just be able to clean all these sites up. And uh, there was, well, we'll talk about some of them today. And they, some of them had a measure of success, but there was never a magic bullet that we discovered that can clean up uh, all these, these solvent sites. And we started realizing it was much harder than, than we had originally thought. Perhaps um, until fairly recently, that, that first reaction that I told you about, what do you do when you have a contaminated site? Let's, let's go in there and remove the source zone. Okay, let's clean up the source zone and then we'll be um, uh, you know, we'll be fine. I think people started realizing uh, more recently, at least in some sites that are a little bit more complicated, that uh, it's not going to be as easy as removing the, the source zone because the, the, the solvent can remain uh, in, the, in the bedrocks. And, and we talked about matrix diffusion. It can remain in the matrix. And, and so even if you remove the source, if you're able to do that, there's still going to be stuff left behind. And so that kind of led to, to this one where we had thought that uh, you know you have to do source zone if you're going to clean if you're going to clean the site up and uh, the, the more recent thinking is well that's you know under everything being equal that's the best thing to do we certainly want to remove the source but um, it may not be the uh, easiest thing to do and it may not actually be that much of an advantage and then um, uh, finally, and I was talking to Tom about this earlier, that um, uh, you know, groundwater was always considered to be the, the primary uh, pathway of concern. And at least more recently, I, I, uh, I, I was kind of surprised to see this. And I talked to Tom, and he, he confirmed that, uh, that vapor intrusion wasn't really on everybody's radar until uh, a little bit more recently. And, and obviously, vapor intrusion was a big Love Canal. People got sick at Love Canal because the vapors were going up into their house and making them sick. So it's been around for a long time, but for some reason, the groundwater has been the focus. And, and now people have started to look to, a little bit more at the, at the vapor transport. OK, so the first step is, uh, is it's was known as the, the remedial investigation. That's kind of where we, we all are now at the Santa Susana site. Uh, you need to characterize the site before you can make any reasonable decisions. And it sounds easy, but characterizing a site, is ex especially a bedrock site, is extremely difficult and extremely complicated. And hopefully you understand why that is after the, uh, after the last talk. And so, um, you know, you, you, you do a lot of scratching your head. This is a graduate student of mine. We made a mess out of this thing. And we're standing there looking at trying to figure out what to do about it now. And uh, I, th I think that's sort of... Uh, you know, a lot of what you're doing when you come to a site, it's, 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 it's very over overwhelming. There's a, a, a tremendous level of complexity. You start collecting data and, and, you know, over time, you start to build an understanding of the site. And then you get to the point where you think, well, we may not understand everything, but hopefully we have enough to so we can start trying to make some initial decisions about how we might clean it up. So, uh, this is, I borrowed the slide from, from Alan Shapiro at the USGS. They have this uh, research site in a, in a mudstone in uh, New Jersey, and this is the former uh, Naval Air Warfare Center. So uh, it's been contaminated for a long time. Um, they, they tested jet engines there. Operations ceased in the 90s, but they've been treating, pumping and treating for 15 years and haven't really uh, gotten very far. So they went in there and uh, they, oops, they went, uh, they used coring techniques. Um, they, they used um, uh, liners that are sensitive to, uh, uh, to free product, to, to NAPL, in this case, DNAPL. They used these Sudan shake kits that are also uh, uh, sensitive to, to free product. And they actually, uh, after many years, started locating free product down in, in, the, uh, in the bedrock. 
And so this was a, 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 you know, a bit of a surprise, uh, not entirely, obviously they weren't surprised that there was an apple down there, but they, they were able to find some of the, uh, uh, the free product. So this is a, a, an example of, uh, of, a, of a site that probably was languishing for a while because it didn't undergo proper characterization. They just started pumping and treating, hoping it was gonna work. And now they're trying to go back and understand what's happening. And this is, this is under the USGS Toxics uh, Hydrology Program. So it's become sort of a, a research site. So, um, okay, so we feel that we've, we've characterized the site. We have some understanding of, of th how things are working. Uh, you know, given this, this understanding, we start asking the obvious questions. Can we clean it up? Uh, if we try and clean up, might we actually make it worse? If we start drilling a bunch of holes, are we gonna, are we gonna mobilize things? What will happen if we just leave it there? And, and, and how, long, how much time do we have? If we, if we you know, argue and, uh, and discuss and study, you know, are things gonna start turning bad uh, because we wait too long? So these are the initial questions you would, you're gonna wanna ask. Um, and so your remedial alternatives, as we, as we discussed, are, are gonna have to keep these questions in mind and also the specifics of the site. So what I wanna do now is go through uh, some alternative technologies that are out there. And, um, I, you know, the, 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 the point here, you have to understand, I don't, I don't want to get so much into the details of any one of these, and I certainly don't want to suggest which of these going to work and which might not at the site, because I, I can't uh, address that. But I want to give you an idea of sort of the universe of options that are out there. Um, there's a couple that I'm gonna discard right off the bat, excavation. I don't think we're gonna dig up the entire mountain, scrub it, put it back together, okay? Um, it'd be nice if we, <laughs> we might be able to do that. Uh, there's something called a permeable reactive barrier. Actually, people tried something similar to this in bedrock, but it's, it's um, pretty researchy at this stage, so I'm gonna leave that aside, and I'm gonna focus on, on these. Now, these are all treatments that also work in unconsolidated material and sediments. Uh, but they've, uh, these, these are, uh, are technologies that, that I know of or I could find examples where they've uh, had some success in, in bedrock. So they're things that you might want to think about. Um, I will, before I go into the particulars, I, I want to note that there are, uh, there, we sort of classify these, these uh, treatment technologies. There's ex situ. That's digging up the whole mountain, scrubbing it and putting it back. Uh, or you can take the water out, clean it, put it back in. These are ex situ, so these are external uh, 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 treatment technologies. Uh, so uh, vapor extraction and sparging, uh, air sparging, uh, pump and treat. Um, barriers and, and collectors, uh, typically you're collecting the water and then that's uh, being treated off site or, uh, or out of the ground. And then there's uh, in situ techniques that where you actually try and destroy the stuff uh, in the ground, okay? So we kind of classify these as ex situ and in situ. And then there's this one down here that I talked about where if everything else fails, you just try and contain it and basically give up. Okay, so uh, here's the first one. This is, this is um, uh, vapor extraction, air sparging. So uh, these are kind of two things being shown at once. You can, if you've got, uh, Volatiles in the Vado zone above the water table, you can basically blow air through it and uh, try and collect those, those vapors and then that goes off to, uh, to treatment. Uh, if you have something in, in shallow groundwater, you can basically bubble air through it or, or another gas and try to uh, volatilize it, bring it up to the Vados and again, suck it out through the, uh, through the uh, surface. Uh, and so this, this is something that works in uh, bedrock. One of the um, uh, more recent uh, um, technologies that have been uh, used quite a bit is, of course, the problem with bedrock is that your, your permeability is limited. So when you try and push air through the vados or try and bubble uh, air through the, through the groundwater, you're gonna be limited by the connections of that, those fractures and the permeability. So, this is uh, being combined uh, more frequently with, with fracturing, artificial fracturing the rock. So pneumatic fracturing, so you're actually, you can, you can force uh, uh, air or gas into the rock and, and open those fractures up a little bit, or hydraulic fracturing where you're pushing in uh, fluids and, and opening up the fracture. 
So you're basically pumping in it so fast that the, the, the rock will, will uh, crack and, and, and break open. And that allows you to circulate air through the vados or bubble gas through the, the groundwater a little bit more efficiently. So um, pump and treat is, is uh, the, the oldest technology that's probably around. Uh, it's still used. It's um, often used uh, very early in a system to sort of uh, uh, create a hydraulic containment. I'll talk a bit more about that later. But as a final treatment remedy, it's been uh, very uh, uh, unsuccessful in rock. And, and all the stuff that we talked about last time is, is the culprit behind the, the, the failure of this. Um, you, you, you can pump all that water out, and you'll find that it starts seeping back out of the matrix. Okay. And so, or if you actually have, free, oops, if you actually have free product, so if you have free product uh, pooled there and you pump, you're going to have that free product is just going to dissolve and then your, your plume's going to come back. And so this is uh, what was discovered when this is applied, uh, not only in bedrock systems, but in heterogeneous systems. So if you have, say, layers of, uh, of, of sand and clay, uh, you, would, you would get all the water or all of the contaminant out of the sand and then it would slowly diffuse out of the clay and you'd be right back where you started from. So you would see your, you'd get all excited because all your contaminant levels would drop and they'd come back. And then you'd pump again and they'd drop and they'd come back. And you just keep going through these cycles. So um, it, uh, it has a limited success in complicated areas. And, and this actually goes back to 1994. Uh, again, this National Research Council uh, document. And they looked at uh, a bunch of pump and treat field examples. So the difficulty of cleanup is basically the, 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 how complicated the geology was. So uh, fractured rock, of course, would be down here, the most difficult. Uh, so you, you see the, the alluvium sites, the simpler sites. They had a, a, a fairly uh, decent uh, uh, success in, in cleaning them up. But down here in these uh, uh, more complicated sites of the... Uh, the 36 sites that they looked at, zero of them were actually cleaned up by pump and treat. So it's been known for a while that pump and treat is not going to be your final solution. Uh, it may be a, a temporary measure, but it's not really all that great as a final solution. And um, I'll remind you, this slide that I showed you last time, one of the reasons is that if you have, uh, if you have a Dean apple, a, a free product, and, and again, this is a this is a, um, a clear cast of fracture so that we can actually see what's going on inside. This is from uh, John Fountain and Lisa Bergsling, uh, uh, Lisa's thesis. You can see as you, as you flush water through this, it's going to leave little droplets behind. And remember the animations I showed you. You can just keep pumping all you want. You're not going to push those out. All you're going to be able to do is dissolve them over time. So uh, this is one of the reasons why pump and treat doesn't work so great. And, and of course, the matrix diffusion is another. Um, so this is, uh, again, I'm going to, I'm reusing all my old slides here. Um, this is a, 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 an actual experiment done by uh, Charlie Harvey and, and his uh, students at, at MIT. And so these are coarse grain sediments with these fine grain sediments in between. And as the water moves across, you can see that you're, uh, you're slowly pulling this contaminant mass out of these, these low permeability zones, but it, it takes a long time. So what this would look like at this end as you're measuring concentrations is this very, very, very long tail of slowly de decreasing concentration. Again, you know, given an infinite amount of time, pump and treat will probably work, but it's not the most efficient way of going about the problem. Oops. Okay, so um, physical barriers and collectors, this is very